What if Aang's pacifism had cost him? What if, in choosing to not kill Ozai, he doomed not only himself, but the world? Even before entering the Avatar state, he could have overpowered the Sozin's comet-fueled Ozai if he had wanted to, but he didn't, because he wanted to avoid killing Ozai at all costs. When Ozai shot lightning at him, he had a chance to redirect it back at Ozai, but he chose not to do so. Aang didn't need the Avatar State to win this, but once he entered it, the fight only became more lopsided. Summoning up the powers of all the past Avatars, he tossed Ozai through stone pillars as though Ozai were a cheap doll. But before he could take Ozai's life, he pulled himself out of the Avatar State, regained control of his impulses, and took Ozai's bending from him with energy bending. But what if... Aang had never learned energy bending? What if the Lion Turtle had never taught it to him? What if he kept searching for a way to defeat the Fire Lord without killing him, but he failed, and the Fire Lord killed him instead? How would it affect Team Avatar? How would it affect the world? This is Avatar Explained, Ozai Wins Edition. First and foremost, it would radically change the message of the show. Avatar is, from start to finish, a show about being presented with two options and managing to create a third. Think about Toph being presented with two ideas. Be herself and be constantly criticized by her parents, or hide her true self from her parents, and instead choosing a third option, that being to run away from her parents and join Team Avatar. Think about Katara at first believing she has to choose between killing her mother's murderer and forgiving him, and then ending up choosing a third option, which is to do neither. She spares his life, but she swears she will never forgive him. Think about Zuko's arc. He's set up at the end of Season 2 as having to choose between joining Team Avatar when he's at his lowest, and reverting back to his old ways and joining Azula. Instead, he does something completely different. He joins Azula, and gets everything he wanted, and then leaves all that behind to join Team Avatar. It's remarkable. But if Aang was killed by the Fire Lord, that would send a radically different message. It would send the message that no, choosing a third option is not possible. You have to choose between violence and weakness. I'm not saying that's not a legitimate view, purely speaking. I'm just saying that's not Avatar. At all. But I'm not here to wrestle with the message this would send ideologically. I'm here to contemplate the political reality of it all. So here's the first question. How successful would Ozai's campaign of genocide be? I'd like to clarify that it would indeed be catastrophic. Sozin was able to kill all of the airbenders except Aang. And while I doubt Ozai would be able to kill every earthbender, considering the sheer size of the Earth Kingdom, he would likely kill more people than Sozin, and thus attain the highest death count of any leader in the Avatar world. However, there are a few obstacles limiting his rampage of destruction. For one, even if Aang doesn't defeat him, the time Ozai spends fighting Aang is time he doesn't spend burning everything to the ground. From what we see of Sozin's Comet in the original timeline, it does not last long. Ozai needs all the time he can get, and having to fight the Avatar certainly diminishes the amount of time he has. Additionally, Ozai faces more resistance than Sozin did. The White Lotus's campaign to take back Ba Sing Se does not involve the Avatar, but it manages to succeed anyway. Zuko and Katara's quest to defeat Azula does not involve the Avatar, but it too succeeds anyway. Likely, at the end of Ozai's campaign of genocide, at least 50% of the Earth Kingdom population is still alive, and Ozai has lost both the capital of the Earth Kingdom and his own capital. His plan to become the supreme ruler of the world will remain unfulfilled. Winning a war is not as simple as burning everything in your path to the ground. Even Sozin understood this. His plan to attack the Air Nation may have been based on several factors, such as the Air Nomads' pacifism and their detachment from earthly matters, but its main purpose was to kill the Avatar to stop him from becoming a threat, and it failed in this regard. The Avatar lived. 
Admittedly, the Avatar did not trouble either Sozin or Azulon, but they were both unable to log more than a few decisive victories. That's enough to fuel propaganda and scare the other nations, but they both did not even manage to capture Ba Sing Se, despite the Fire Nation's technology being notably superior to the tech of other nations. The Earth Kingdom is still a feudal and medieval nation, while the Fire Nation is an industrial power, but this doesn't matter. Winning a war is not that simple. The Fire Nation has spent a hundred years fighting this war, that they have been unable to win it is less a sign of their military weakness than a sign of the constraints inherent in trying to control a country much larger and more populous than one's own. Even after the fall of Ba Sing Se, the citizens of the Earth Kingdom keep fighting. The Earth Kingdom is decentralized. It's a kingdom in the old-fashioned view of the word, in which most communities kept to themselves and had little to no interaction with the central authority. They pay taxes and receive some degree of military protection, but that's about it. I'd wager that if you asked the average citizen of the Earth Kingdom what the name and dynasty of the Earth King was, most wouldn't be able to give you an answer. As such, Ozai's Scorched Earth strategy isn't going to stop Earth Kingdom revolts. If anything, it's only going to encourage them, especially among the central and southern parts of the kingdom, which before this had been relatively free from Fire Nation assaults when compared to the western states. Regimes predicated on killing literally everyone who opposes you do not tend to last long. And even if they survive, they're unhealthy, and they're terribly corrupt, as everyone tries to avoid getting on the leader's bad side. The death of Stalin, for all its deliberate anachronisms, actually does a fantastic job at presenting all the anxiety and paranoia that took hold during the Stalin regime. The events immediately preceding the Song of Ice and Fire books effectively skewer the idea that burning everything in your path is pragmatic. Aris Targaryen, the Mad King, tried to quash dissent with fire the same way Ozai does here, and it backfired tremendously. The North had never liked being ruled by the Targaryens, but it had resigned itself to that rule nonetheless. That all changed when Eris burned the head of the house, Rickard Stark, and his firstborn son, Brandon Stark. They had come to King's Landing, investigating the disappearance of Rickard's daughter and Brandon's sister, Lyanna. They thought she had been kidnapped. Instead of handling the situation with grace and eloquence, Eris decides to kill them. Not a great idea. This burning, as much as, if not more so than, Lyanna's disappearance, is what caused the rebellion that brought down the centuries-old Targaryen dynasty. Fire doesn't solve everything. Interestingly, Ozai bears a few striking similarities to Eris, and not just because they're both mad, and because their daughters turned out to be even madder. Their predecessors used violence smartly and tactically to maintain order. That's how their empire stayed in power. However, Ozai and Eris both have no restraint. They use violence because it makes them feel powerful. Even if Aang dies, Ozai's rampage likely spells doom for the current Fire Nation system in the long term. After the passing of Sozin's Comet, Ozai is likely disappointed that members of the Earth Kingdom still live, but he returns home with a smug smile on his face, only to find that his daughter has been defeated and his banished son has assumed the throne. This results in a civil war, with the Fire Nation being divided into a faction that supports Zuko and one that supports Ozai. I suspect that Ozai, having superior resources, would win, but the internal struggle in the Fire Nation gives the Earth Kingdom a perfect opportunity to launch a counterattack. Sections of the Earth Kingdom that hitherto considered themselves to have few similarities with each other would suddenly see each other as brothers and sisters in arms. They would have a common goal to defeat the Fire Nation, and in the pursuit of that common goal, they would see each other as having a singular culture and history. 
That's not to say people would stop caring what region they're from, but many would come to see this as less important than the fact that they're all Earth Kingdom citizens, united against a foreign power. There is still an us and a them, but the us becomes the entire Earth Kingdom, and the them becomes the Fire Nation. This is called nationalism, and it's a concept that is largely misunderstood among those who have not extensively studied history. As I have, let me explain it to you in brief. Nationalism has had many different places on the political spectrum throughout history. The nationalism of a powerful country seeking to deport those coming into it from a less powerful country is obviously different from the nationalism of a colonized country united against the powerful country or countries that have exploited it for centuries. But what's relevant to this video is the following question. Are there examples in history of nationalism becoming mainstream in a country in response to a campaign of conquest? like what I'm saying happens in the Earth Kingdom in response to the genocide committed by the Fire Nation. Yes. The answer is yes. Absolutely yes. If I were to list out all the ones I could think of, this video would be several hours long, and we would be no closer to fully investigating the scenario, so I'm going to use one example in particular, the spread of nationalism throughout Europe in response to Napoleon's invasion of the continent. No, Napoleon did not burn tens of millions alive, and European countries are much smaller than the Earth Kingdom, but the dynamic is largely the same. Before Napoleon's invasion, the people of Europe largely identified themselves by who their king was, or what province they lived in. The invasion caused them to think of themselves as united peoples fighting against the French invaders. Of course, there would be drawbacks to this new Earth Kingdom nationalism, it would oppose the trend we see take place from the end of Avatar to the beginning of Korra. In the original timeline, this is an era in which the distinction between the nations is not as important as it once was. This is even a time that births a new multicultural country called the United Republic, Founded on Earth Kingdom land occupied by the Fire Nation during the 100 Year War, it represents a new kind of world. Despite its flaws, the Legend of Korra presents the United Republic as a force for good and for unity. Yet in a world in which the Earth Kingdom is set ablaze with the spark of nationalism, the United Republic likely never exists. It only came into being because of a perfect combination of factors those being a weakened Earth Kingdom, a benevolent Fire Nation headed by Zuko, and Aang's strength and legitimacy as an Avatar. Before the Fire Nation itself is defeated, this new nationalistic unity and organization would allow the Earth Kingdom to capture several Fire Nation colonies. Likely all Fire Nation colonials will be required to leave the cities, even if they have lived in those cities their entire lives. Team Avatar and internationalist organizations such as the White Lotus will likely be worried about this, but there won't be much they can do. True, the fact that they liberated Ba Sing Se will give them some pull, but it likely won't give them as much as they expected. If they wanted to maximize their political advantage, they would set up an interim government in Ba Sing Se, and govern the city themselves until the Earth Kingdom forces agreed to treat the Fire Nation citizens fairly, but this would be a cynical and coldly strategic move. Team Avatar likely would be too committed to working with the Nationalists against the Fire Nation to consider such a move. By the time Ozai is able to defeat Zuko and retake the capital city, his forces will be weakened. With Sozin's comet long past, he will have lost his advantage. Zuko and Katara leave the city and formally ally themselves with the Earth Kingdom forces, who because of their nascent nationalistic spirit are reluctant to accept the son of the Fire Lord, but with great effort he is able to convince them that his intentions are good and that he is not like his father. They are still suspicious of him though, and those suspicions never really go away. But they bury these suspicions for the purpose of stopping the Fire Nation invasion. The remaining members of Team Avatar call a meeting in Ba Sing Se to plan strategy. The leaders of the provinces are all there, as are the top generals. There is a significant divide between those who support the monarchy and those who don't. Now, monarchy is not necessarily opposed to nationalism. A strong monarch can provide a figure for a country to rally around, even if that figure is not the instrument of the unification. 
We see this in late 19th century Germany with Kaiser Wilhelm I. But the Earth King is not that kind of monarch. He is weak, and it wouldn't be unreasonable for some of the more disgruntled members of the military to argue that he has no right to rule. The pro-monarchy and anti-monarchy factions threaten to tear the united front apart, but Katara manages to heal the rift, at least for now. Sokka invents a clever plan, and the Earth Kingdom defeats the Fire Nation, which has mostly devolved into infighting. A number of citizens support Zuko and a peaceful resolution to the war, and that number only grows as it becomes increasingly clear that the Fire Nation has absolutely no chance to win the war. There are two possibilities going forward. The first is that Zuko kills his father. This is something he is willing to do, considering he said to Aang that Aang shouldn't hesitate to do it. He didn't kill Ozai during their confrontation in Episode 311, The Day of Black Sun Part 2, because he said that it is the Avatar's destiny to kill the Fire Lord, not his destiny. The subtext of the scene is that he does not want to kill the Fire Lord because his entire life up to this point has been nothing but destruction and violence. He's willing to inflict violence if it needs to be done to create a better world, but he doesn't want to use violence any more than is absolutely necessary. He wants to break from his past, wherein he was powered by sullen rage, and he eventually achieves that break in Episode 313, The Firebending Masters. But in this alternate timeline, he acknowledges how much suffering could have been eliminated if he had killed the Fire Lord during the Day of Black Sun, and he likely kills him here. However, if Zuko can't bring himself to do it, or if he doesn't get the chance, then Ozai is merely defeated and forced to sign a Treaty of Absolute Surrender. Zuko will take the throne, but he will be viewed by many of his own people as an Earth Kingdom puppet. A civil war likely breaks out. If it does, he emerges victorious, as he has the support of other nations, but it is still an inauspicious start to Zuko's rule. It's a sign that the world is still cold and tense. It's less the start of a new age, and more a continuation of all the anxiety that had existed during the 100-year war. The 100-year war may be over, but the world still crackles with conflict. So thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can, and you want to see more content like this. Keep watching Avatar. It's a fantastic show with fascinating characters and so many interesting possibilities. And tune in soon for the next Avatar Explained video. I swear it will be coming soon. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.